Previously on Drake Paragon. Still a bit of sailing ahead. We ready to go? Hi Trotsky. He's from America. You can't avoid hitting the ice at some point or another. Eventually somebody said, buy a house. We should be in Nassau about 2.30. What do you love so much that you want to live here for the rest of your life? <laughs> So this is a private dock, it belongs to the Narsoc Boating Association. We make the decisions about how we want to spend our money and, huh. and all those things and what, what kinds of things we want to be doing. I'm nice. the chairman actually. Oh you are? Yeah. <laughs> just re recently elected by default, nobody wanted the job. <laughs> So is this for used engine oil? Yeah, yeah. Then it gets sent back and disposed of properly somewhere in Denmark. Wow. Yeah. wow, used engine oil sent all the way back to Denmark. We had this built recently. It's a thing you can put your boat up on at high tide, and then when low tide comes, you can work on the boat. If you tie it up here, you maybe put a rope up to the tower here or whatever. Huh. Maybe loosen the ropes as the tide goes down, and as the tide comes up, you have to make sure that the boat can come up with it. And then, and yeah. Fantastic. Sort of a primitive way of uh, getting at the hole. Yeah. yeah. Without having to take the boat out of the water. Aye. They've been talking about this for years and years and finally I got a local guy to just give us an offer and I said, okay, do it. Yeah. <laughs> really? So yeah. you approved it? I made some phone calls to the other members of the, what we call it, the, the, the board of directors. Huh, mm -hmm. huh. And I said, that, you know, can, can we do this? And they all said, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> that old tractor, that's our tractor. That's your tractor. That's really? Matthew Ferguson from 1950. What do you use it for? To tow the boat out of the water, put oh. the boat back in the water. We also have a trailer so we can transport stuff around them. Um, <laughs> yeah, all kinds of stuff. Well, I haven't seen one of these since I've been I've and never seen I, one. If I had <laughs> run the battery down on the boat, and I mean, then I could fire her up and we could huh. take it back. But. It's got the deluxe seating edition, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Good, we, that's good. That's good. Actually, like we it. bought a new seat. So we just haven't gone around installing it yet. And, yeah. and we're going to start fighting the rust and all this. But, uh, mm. It's rough on an old tractor when you, you, you're working, using it to put a boat in salt water. And yeah. They're indestructible. And you can get almost all the spare parts from England. Yeah. It's not even the same company producing them anymore. It's other companies. People renovate these things. Someone picked this up for, I think, 15 quid or something. I was like, yeah. the posters, I think, was almost more than that. <laughs> We haven't gone around to installing it, but I've got a new toolbox, that we, ah. a brand new toolbox that we can install. We've got new foot pedals that need to be installed. We, we bought a horn, so we can have a horn. And kits to redo the motor with the, the rings and everything. Perkins three-cylinder diesel engine. No the way. legendary Perkins engine. It's got a Perkins in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it starts immediately. Oh, Narsa. <laughs> These yellow buildings, those are homes? Yeah, these are homes. This is like an independent living for the elderly. It's the link to the home for the elderly, which is up here. Oh, wow. What is that? Uh, well, this is one of these traditional shot houses that they build as part of the museum here. Turf, turf. You take, turf. You cut sections out of grass. Yeah. And then you've got the roots of the grass and everything. It's all very compact. And then you've got a building material combined with stones and wood and whale bones originally. It's not open now. We'd have to go through the museum, but yeah. So at one time, everybody was living in houses like this? Yeah, that, yeah, up until the 19... Uh, 1940s, 1950s, the absolute the vast majority of the members lived in houses like this. And it wasn't until the 1960s that they started to build a lot of the wooden houses that you see around town. That happened in the 60s? In the 60s. There was a huge push to get people out of houses like this because they were very unhealthy. Yep. People were building, uh, burning these traditional lamps where they were burning seal fat. Yep. And that produced a lot of smoke. And there were high incidences of TB. And so it was really important to get people out of those houses and into places where they had electricity, running water, yeah. um, central heating. Sewage. And, and eventually sewage. Wow. Yeah. But not all houses have sewage, as you'll see. Even today? Yeah, yeah. even today. Yeah. yeah. So what do they do? 
Cut it. Yeah, you shit in a bucket. Yeah, and then where does it go from there? I mean, it's did... dumped in the fjord. It gets collected by the city uh, uh, people and dumped in the fjord. Wow! That's yeah, that's, it that's, doesn't that's get... where all the waste goes. It all goes in the fjord. It doesn't get processed. No, there's or... no, no. They there's... just dump it in no, the, not, in not the water. No, not even Nuuk has a, um, a sewage treatment plant. No dice. No, no dice. No. Is, oh, it, is that a problem? So is that polluting the water? Yet, no, but it is a bit. Um, uh, over the long term, you, it would make sense to process the sewage to some extent. It huh. depends on the population. If the yep. population were to grow, yep. I'm yep. sure it would become a problem. Yeah. Oh. Indiscriminate dumping of sewage in the ocean. Wow. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The entire. That's not a good thing. Is it uh, like all of Greenland? The entire. All of Greenland. Yeah. The entire country is dumping its sewage, uh, raw sewage, into the fjords. Wow. Yeah. But these fjords are up to you know, up to 600 meters deep. Yep. Huge currents. You know, very strong currents that sweep through here. It gets just taken out. Now, it's not a huge problem, but you don't oh. want to eat a lot of shellfish that are growing in right next to a, a town. Wow! Yeah. Yes, we were told about that. I was doing some fishing in in Kamush, and they said just don't eat any of the fish from the southern end. Just, if you're going to go fishing, just fish in the northern end. And yeah. The current. Just yeah. Where they dump it here, they call it the chocolate factory. Oh <laughs> God! <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that blows my mind. The entire country of Greenland, all the sewage just gets dumped in the water. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, you think about how many people live here and so on. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's not it's enough people to make a difference. No, it's just not worthwhile, I think. It doesn't make that much of a difference. Huh. It's the local fish market there. Yeah. Ooh. It's fabulous. You go in and you've got everything's well prepared and sometimes it's, they've already filleted it for you. You've got uh, um, sometimes uh, fish that's just ready to be made into fish burgers. Yep. Because yep. they've already put it through a oh. meat grinder. And oh, wow. Well, now we are leaving downtown Nasa, <laughs> proceeding to the suburbs. I see. This is more or less like a bingo hall, wedding reception, uh, event place. A community center of sorts. <laughs> the place where people gather, that's the direct translation from the Danish. Oh. Hey, 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 yeah. <laughs> so you do that every time you come to a, a, a try road. To think of it, yeah. I try to try to remember. Has he started to stop automatically when you come to a road? Sometimes he, he realized there are certain places where we always stop, and he yeah. knows that. And he sort of looks at you like, are "You gonna do it again?" Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you get a lot of avalanches with the snow, or not many? No, not many. but there was there was that one winter it was here. Yeah. And it hit that red house over there, which has something to do with water purification, and knocked in the end wall of the house, filled the entire house with snow and ice and rocks. Avalanche. Wouldn't want my house there. <laughs> and then they spent weeks digging it out. We weren't in town at the time we heard about it. We thought it was an avalanche, oh. no. And then I saw the repair jobs that they were doing on there, and I saw them carting out this chunks of ice and rocks and whatnot. And like, okay, I get it. Wow. <laughs> it was an avalanche. It was heavy duty. So this is our house here. The blue house with the white picket fence. Wow, the white picket fence. How long have you lived in this house now? Twelve years now. Twelve years, right. Yeah. We basically used the other house as a base while we were renovating this place. We would come here, work all day, and then go back there, sleep. Aye. Um, there's something that smells so enticing over there. <laughs> It's like Facebook for dogs. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, he's been here. Oh. oh and what about the other dog? Yeah, there's, oh, the other dog's been there too. Oh. Yours is the only house with a white picket fence? Yeah, uh, just about. I think we've got one of the nicest fences in town, yeah. I would say, without bragging too much. Mm -hmm. right? But it was a ridiculous project. It took six years to build. We were working for a carpenter, uh, and, and he had a fence like this, and we said, how did you do it? And he said, oh, it's really easy, man. You just, you just, whenever there's a crate, an old crate, you just, you just collect all the wood from that crate. And then all you have to do is remove a few, you know, nails and staples and stuff. And then maybe like store it for a while, let it dry out nicely. Huh. And, um, and then they need to be cut down, you know, because they're a bit wider. And then you need to do this and that and everything. And then you need to paint them once on this side and that side and dip them like this and do this and do that. And we just started, you know, and after a while we sort of did the math and we said, it's going to be about 500 of these. Yeah. And I don't know how many times I, I moved these boards from one place to another and here and there and where do I put them and so on. And we need, to, oh, we need to go back and, and cut these and then store these and this and that and the other thing. And, 
And then we started digging these fence, fence post holes, and they, need, they needed to go down 70 centimeters, he said, with, yep. with uh, concrete and so on. And I did all of that by hand, and I was like, I, never again. I would do it differently. Today. Yeah. Yeah, but it took six years to build the fence. <laughs> it'll, it'll last a hundred years, I'm yeah. sure. So the wood is from crates? Yeah, this is just, this is cheap crap wood that, you know, from crates. Do they do that often? Only when there's some party, so they, they must be celebrating something, like oh. first day of school for some kid or something, you know? Or How many people live in Narsak? About 1,500. Narsak. Uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, Narsak. that sounds good. Yeah, like when you're about to gargle, it's kind of this, you close the airflow down here. Uh -huh. It's supposed to, it's, that sounds good. Uh, Narsak. Narsak. Uh, it has three of them, three cues. And of course, a cue at the beginning of a word is pronounced a little bit different than the cue at the end. So, it's you know, the, but the the final cue is has a is really usually pretty pretty well pronounced. So. Not so. I think we should have met you when we first got here. Yeah, <laughs> we had some. I, I heard also. Yeah, you were talking about uh, bamute. A P in Greenland is pronounced as if it were a B. Mm -hmm. Bamute. Yeah. Bamute. Bamute. Yeah. Bamute. Yeah, that's it's bamute, not pamute. Oh. Mm -hmm. And my Greenlandic students teaching them English, they had trouble with P and B. Yeah. And yeah. they would call me ball, and I would say, No, a ball is what you play with. My name's Paul. <laughs> and then I would say, Imagine an American tourist arrives in. That town on the west coast. Yeah. What would they say? They wouldn't say bombute. They would say palmute. Oh no. Yeah. So think of that as uh, have that in your head. Like that a p to us is really pronounced differently than a b. I, I think for some of them help. Some of them could say my name more or less correctly. It says Paul, not Paul. Paul is playing with the ball and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you taught English. Yeah. I, actually, I'm a, a trained English teacher. Wow. I, uh, English as a second language, and then French. So uh -huh. I, I, I did that after I got my degree in French. I went yep. back and got a teaching certification. Yeah. Did you teach English here? I did at the high school, and then I taught English at a vocational school mm -hmm. where people brush up on their, on their math and, and English and, and Danish and Greenlandic and whatnot um, mm -hmm. so they can then become carpenters and oh. uh, electricians and painters. And did you learn Greenlandic? Uh, we're working on it, but yeah. it's it's a tough nut to crack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like code. It's very logical. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's oh. very logical. There's, a, there's always an explanation for why things are the way they are. But uh, huh. How long did you teach English for? What was it like? Did you enjoy it? Uh, it was rough. I thought it was... Uh, I enjoyed teaching the, the, the smaller kids. But the older ones were... The older ones, uh, in some cases, uh, I think part of the problem was that they were getting paid to be there. They figured as long as they were using, you know, taking up breathing space in the room, then they were doing their part. They mm -hmm. had to attend to get money. I'm not that sure I understand. Rough. Why were they being paid to well, that's the That's the Danish system, is that if you, if you reach a certain age, 15, 16 years old, mm -hmm. you're paid to mm -hmm. attend courses. You're, you, you get a, a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I said it would be the other way around. If you're if in the U.S., you would be paying... Huge. You would be paying my salary more or less directly. You would yeah. be paying tuition yeah. um, for this kind of program. And they said, and they, that didn't make... Sense to, them. sense to them, and and then if, of course they, if they arrived 15 minutes late for class, then I could say, oh, I'm docking you an hour. You know, you're late for this hour. Then I'd get their attention. Yeah. Wow, there because money they wouldn't them. get yeah. paid. That's amazing. Yeah. I never so it's knew like they were that. getting about eight hundred dollars uh, a month to attend these classes, and these are 15 year olds. It's a lot of money for that a 15 year old who's living at home. 800 bucks a month. That's the way it works in, in, in at a university level, also in Denmark. Students are paid. They see it as their job. There was a big conflict in Denmark concerning uh, so reducing the amount of money that students get. And the mm -hmm. students said, you know, this is our job. Mm -hmm. Our job is to be a student. Well, How different can it be? You know, in the U.S., we pay for the privilege of coming to this, this university. And yeah. there, it's, uh, we're getting paid yeah. to do this. That's our job. It's unbelievable. Um, it's completely so, opposite. Yeah, this is, you know, and then they transfer that here. That still just blows my mind. They go to school not to learn, but to make money. Well, uh, that's the, the idea being that, that uh, if you didn't pay them to go, then there would be no motivation. That's, that's the motivating factor. And I, and, and, and that's, I think it sends the wrong signal. That's yeah. my, my feeling. I don't know. It's problematic. It's, mm -hmm. you know, how do you motivate people to get an education? Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. It's really Denmark that's spending that money, isn't it? It's the Greenlandic government that decides how the money is spent, but a lot of the money comes from Denmark in the form of a huge subsidy, a lump sum that they get every year. Yep. Um, I'm sure Denmark has tons of money, but... There seems to be so much 
infrastructure here that's been built up and requires money to maintain and Absolutely. run. Yeah. And I look around, I kind of wonder, like, where does all the money come from? And It takes a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every town of this size has its own whatever, you know, yep. heliport or airport, uh, you know. Har harbor facilities, hospital, mm -hmm. schools, and whatnot, and huh. so, yeah, sure. And it's all paid for by this money that comes from Denmark. Not all of it, but a lot of it, so definitely, yeah. How it's hard to know exactly where the money comes from, but a lot of money, yeah. My impression is that Greenland couldn't function or couldn't survive without the infusion of... Um, I don't think they could. I think about 50% of uh, m the money that's in public coffers every year comes from Denmark in the form of the subsidy. So they have to reduce that 50% down to zero in order to have any chance of becoming independent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's more to independence than just money as well, yep. I mean, obviously. But that would be a start, at mm -hmm. least financial, to be financially independent. What does Denmark get in exchange for this infusion of money to maintain the country? Uh... Quite a bit, actually. Almost yeah. all the products that are sold here are Danish products. Oh, okay. It's the largest island in the world. The prestige of having that as being part of the Danish kingdom. Mm -hmm. Denmark is a NATO member, and as part of their obligations as a member of NATO, mm -hmm. they have to supply air bases and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Part of that is done through Greenland. That's where the Greenlanders say, ah, perhaps there's a secret deal. I've heard this theory many times before, Yeah. that Denmark is getting probably more money under the table from the U.S. to be able to have these bases up uh, in northern Greenland than what they're spending. There's a discussion that the Danish government yearly can discount, discount from, from NATO. NATO because of the U.S. military in Tula. Mm -hmm. Tule Air Base is the U.S. Armed Forces' northernmost installation. The base operates a ballistic missile early warning system capable of detecting and tracking intercontinental ballistic missile attacks and conducting space surveillance and satellite tracking. U.S. base in Tula. Oh. Danish government get a discount for that. And it should be more worth than uh, our money here yeah. from Denmark to yeah, Greenland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's been denied repeatedly by Danish officials. But it definitely does come into the balance in some way. Maybe they don't actually get cash in hand, mm -hmm. but perhaps uh, it, it goes into the formula of, yeah. okay, little Denmark is actually making a large contribution here alone. They don't have to perhaps send uh, as many troops to Afghanistan or whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. They do. There have been Danish troops in Afghanistan hmm. for years now. But certainly the fact that the U.S. has this huge uh, air base up in Tula, that plays a role uh, in terms of NATO. Mm -hmm. um, if the Greenlanders uh, became totally independent and said, we want to negotiate directly with the U.S., perhaps it would be um, a loss to Denmark. That's at least part of the theory. And then, of course, um, there are the, the minerals and, 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 and the oil, mm -hmm. if it ever does get going, the Denmark will get a share. Denmark will basically get about 50% of all the revenues, of all the profit that That's comes from, yeah. from mining and oil. So if there is a huge industry here and billions of dollars are, are earned, mm. then Denmark will end up getting half of that. So they'll, they'll get back a lot of their investment. They're yeah. planning on that, banking on that. Certainly it's somewhere in, in yeah, they're not going to just let that go. No. So That's part of the deal that they've made with them now. It's yeah. the 50%, yep. literally. The first 75 million crowns, I think, per year Greenland can keep, but okay. after that they split it 50-50, reducing the, the subsidy down to zero, and then they have to renegotiate mm -hmm. what happens after that. So is the Greenlandic government trying to push forward with mining and oil? One of the biggest challenges that the Greenlandic parliament mm -hmm. is, is that too of big of course, uh, mining? Mining? Yeah. Mining. Yeah. Did you want more mining, less mining, control of mining? More mining. More mining. They said they wanted to. Uh, I think that they're getting cold feet in certain with certain projects. So there's a huge uh, uh, aluminum plant that's been planned for a town called uh, Manitok with a company called Alcoa. They're a huge producer of aluminum, and that would generate jobs. But that project seems to have mm -hmm. come more or less to a standstill. Mm -hmm. I don't see much uh, progress being there. And the, pro the mining project here has also been put on hold. Mm for the time being. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, they're, they're bleeding in a sense because the deal that they made with Denmark was that this subsidy wouldn't be raised, it would be frozen, mm -hmm. yep. 
but it would increase, increase with inflation, but with, inf with the rate of inflation in Denmark. Yeah. And we have a, a, a higher rate of inflation in, in Greenland. So it amounts to a, a net loss of about 100 million crowns a year that doesn't increase as fast, fast as it normally would. They can't just go back and say, sorry, you know, we've got a, a hole in our budget, you know. Mm -hmm. No, no, you made a deal. You want access to the minerals? You've got access to the minerals. What is the uh, American military presence here in Greenland like? How big is it? And what's Up in Tula, it's, I think it's fairly important. It's lost a lot of importance now that the Cold War is over. Yep. They're no longer worried about Russian missiles. That base was built in the 40s? I think it was built in the 40s, yeah. yeah. The Americans at one point had eight bases here. Yeah, and that's the last one. It was very important. I don't think it's as important now. But huh. Huh. Who knows? I wonder how many people are there on the base, how many Americans? I don't know. I think it's it's hundreds, not thousands, but I think mm -hmm. it is hundreds. Mm. So you've got the Danish military here, the Danish Navy in particular. Right, right. They have two ships. They patrol the waters here. Huh. Yeah. And then you've got the Americans up there. Huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder what the Americans are doing up there nowadays. It may play a role in the future if there's some sort of Star Wars program. They may use the base to relay information to settle. I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. You'd have to ask them. Mm. <laughs> Let's go talk to the military base. Be like, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> They'd love that. Would you, Would you like, like to, to talk to the U.S. Secretary of Defense? Could I just ask you what you're doing? Would you like to be in my documentary? <laughs> <laughs> so you have an antenna there? Is that for TV? That's TV, yeah. yeah. That's our TV antenna. And do you grow vegetables? Yeah, it's been an off year for vegetables. We had a cold spring and a cold early summer, and then we took off just at a critical growing period when we should have sort of we should have been keeping things warm on cloudy days and watering them carefully and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so the radishes and the onions and the lettuce have are, are miniature this year. Uh. Yeah, and then my wife is not here is it, right now, so I'm all alone. I've got other priorities rather than the, the lettuce. <laughs> This is home sweet home. For 12 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's beautiful. This house was built in 1953. It's uh, has undergone various transformations over the years. 1953? Yeah, at a time, actually, it was uh, just before they actually even had electricity in the town, so uh, all the wiring and stuff was done afterwards. It's all uh, sort of visible wiring. You can see where they yeah. put the conduit through and stuff. Yep. Uh, you know, stuff like this with the conduit up there. Wow, that's wiring. Yeah, that's yeah, the wi that's the old fashioned wiring there that, that's like, oh yeah, we got electricity. Okay, let's just put in electricity, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This window didn't exist. There was no window, it was just a wall there when we perfect perfect place. place for it. Yeah. We put in a new countertop and a new sink and a new faucet. Do you know just about everybody in the entire town? No, we don't, but people know who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're yeah. sort of the exotic birds here, so sometimes mm -hmm. people We'll get into conversations with people on the street, and, the, and, and then we'll start talking about this or that, and they'll say, oh yeah, we know that about you. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> or they think they do. In the beginning, they thought I was a rich Dutch doctor. Really? Yeah. So and I was like, rumors. I'm not a doctor, I'm not Dutch. Well, what is the rich Dutch doctor and his wife doing on the roof, fixing the roof <laughs> for days and days on end? So this is the, the, the place, uh, it's, it's kind of... I don't know, it's become a bachelor pad because my wife's away, but mm -hmm. I've got the laundry hanging here. But, uh, you know, one of these winter projects you have, you we, we reupholstered the furniture in there ourselves last winter because we decided wow. it would be nicer than buying new furniture. Uh, Reupholstered. Yeah. Beautiful. So that was a fun winter project. But these are all books about Greenland. Yeah. In various languages, English, German, French. And some of the books are classics. Mm -hmm. Others perhaps less known. Um, see what we got. I never say no to coffee. <laughs> what does your wife do? Uh, web design, um, nice. graphic design. <laughs> She's an architect. Does she also work remotely through the internet? Yeah, it yeah. has a lot to do with the internet yeah. as well. Yeah. Do you speak English much living here? Are there people mm, here who speak primarily no, English? No, not much English, no. Oh. Mostly mostly Danish and then, and mostly German with my wife. So, wow. so you haven't spoken English in, in a while until... Well, I'm on the phone sometimes with people. I, the people I work for, sometimes I speak English with them. Mm -hmm. I was the, the Spiegel staff, they're in, native English speakers. <laughs> so I'm on the phone with them sometimes. Not often, but... Mm -hmm. um, and then I, these days with Skype and so on, I'm yeah. in contact with my folks back in the States and mm -hmm. friends who speak English. So. Wow. 
I think my English is better now than when I was living in Berlin because we get we get a lot of English language programming on TV, mm-hmm. British series and and Irish and whatever things from the BBC, things from the States. That's actually how I learned Danish because you're re- reading the subtitles. You sort of put yep. two and two together. Ah, oh, there's that word again. Oh, this time it has that meaning. Yeah. I don't know how it's pronounced, but but I'm recognizing yep. it. You know, it's mm-hmm. coming in. And oh, so you, you learn Danish from watching. We films learned a lot from sometimes. watching. Yeah, because it was every night you turn on the TV and there would be something with subtitles. Mm-hmm. And, and invariably, it's now sometimes it was Swedish with with Danish subtitles that didn't really give us much. But when it's English and you get this, the subtitles, you're you're there's a lot that's that you're taking on board, mm-hmm. sort of subconsciously more or less. It must have been a real challenge. I was a really big linguist coming up here. And would you say like Greenlandic is going to be your Everest to, to get over it? Yeah, that's my Everest. Yeah, that's yeah. A, yeah. Oh, that's, my wife calls it a four-dimensional puzzle. Greenlandic is, I, I think, a very mel- rather melodious language um, mm-hmm. and not incredibly hard, I don't think, to pronounce. But the words very quickly get very long. It's kind of the salami language. You take all these slices and sort of combine them to create longer and longer words. And then mm-hmm. very often the translation of one word is a whole sentence. Really? In, in English yeah, or any other European language. Wow. Yeah. I was very interested when I got here to try and pick up some of the language, just to be polite to be able to talk to people. Sure, yeah. I didn't yeah. realize what I was getting into. Yeah. I had, yeah. I had one guy who... Uh, who, he kind of took me under his wing a little bit. Anytime he came to the boat, he'd try and teach me a couple of phrases and a couple of words. And uh, I asked him, they, we have a book on board sometimes, um, people will sign. But he just left a short message saying good luck or uh, something basic. And it turned into, it was nearly like 15, 16 words long. I mean, uh, just to say, oh, I met you on the boat. Uh, good luck with your voice. Right, and that was a huge, yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's not a language where it makes sense to memorize words because you're unlikely to see the same words um, unless it's a very simple word, a very basic word. You, you don't see this, you don't see individual words uh, reappearing. What you, what you have to learn is, is how to manipulate the language. Um, yeah. You might find, for example, there's a certain ending, like they have endings on, that you can attach to verbs. One ending might mean uh, first person, second person. In mm-hmm. other words, me, you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, akit is that, that ending. So, and then you've got the ending, you, me. Mm-hmm. The other thing, you, you know, you, you give me the bread, you know, I give you the bread, or something, or I see you, you see, see me. It doesn't have the concept of an infinitive. Mm-hmm. So you can't just sort of speak baby Greenlandic. You can't just learn a bunch of words like eat, sleep, see, and then say I eat. me me eat. In English that works. You can say me eat today. And you're under- and people understand you. It's yeah. not grammatical, but people understand you. But there's no eat, so to speak, in Greenlandic, no infinitive. Mm-hmm. There's a root that means to eat, but then that has to be combined with an ending that means first person or second person. Mm-hmm. So if you want to say uh, I'm eating, then it has to be Nerivunga. Yeah. If you say you're eating, then it's Neri Vutit. Yeah, and if you and want to say he's eating, it's Neri Vok. Neri alone, it never exists alone. It means to eat, but it doesn't exist alone. It just doesn't make sense when you just say it. Like yeah, that. it's sort of, yeah. it's like, for example, in English you have this L-Y makes an adjective into an, an adverb. You know, quick becomes quickly. But if you go to somebody and say, Lee, they go, don't understand what you're saying. And that, that's the way a lot of these things in Greenlandic are. If you go to somebody and you say Neri, they they might figure out it's something to do with Eat. whether the verb to see is is ta- uh, taku taku but nobody says just taku it has to be like taku akit means I see you mm-hmm. that ending mean akit means me you wow. you've got I think like twenty three different endings because they're all the, just about every imaginable combination has its own ending wow. some of them are doubled up but it's you know it's like we you you us etc uh, etc et you have all these endings if you don't get the right ending the meaning is totally wrong. Mm-hmm. So you can't, you can't just sort of learn, you know, uh, me, you, eat. It doesn't work that The language doesn't work that way. You have to get those things together in a, in a, in a way that, that, that Greenlanders are used to, to, to hearing so that it comes out right. Otherwise, you might say, instead of, you know, I'm, I see you, um, you know, they, say, they, they see us or something. It's something totally different. The meaning is wrong. Yeah. It's one uh, word. That's just a basic, yeah, that's one word. That's yeah. why the words are so long. Yeah. And then you can combine even more things like that. You know, I see you. I see you occasionally, maybe, or whatever. You know, that might be all one word as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, or, or I'm going to see you, the future. Then that would also be there's a, there's a bit that means the future huh. that gets sort of inserted as well. But that never exists on its own is either. It has to be. In, so then you have all these bits and pieces that start to get inserted and so on. So there's no point in, in memorizing specific 
words, you know, like the words like, you know, I'm going to see you. Mm -hmm. Okay, you might use that again, but, you know, he's, he's going to arrive, you know. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you have to really learn how to, how to juggle all the little pieces huh. and, and put them together. We couldn't find an English to Greenlandic dictionary. I'm wondering. There really doesn't exist a decent dictionary in English. In English uh, Greenlandic. And given the structure of the language, the dictionaries are not very helpful because very often you look up a word and unless you understand exactly how that word is put together, mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's it just doesn't. I mean, everything is is as about as foreign as it gets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, things make sense, mm -hmm. but but it helps to, to to be able to understand the, the various pieces, like the word for airplane. Um, is a word that, that, that they created, obviously, a hundred years ago. There were no airplanes up here. Mm -hmm. And it's timi sartok. Timi mm -hmm. means to fly. Sar mm -hmm. means something that regularly happens, it regularly does. And tok is, a, is a, a noun like ending. It's a thing that flies. It's nearly the description that, in, in the little segments. It's very descriptive. And, and, and place names here as well, they're almost always descriptive. Nuuk means a, a, the, the tip of a peninsula. Mm -hmm. And just about every other place name, hakatok means white. Apparently there was something white there. Mm -hmm. Maybe guano from seagulls. That's yeah. one of the stories that I heard. Mm. Um, certainly not from the ice. We have more ice in, in Narsak than we have there. I'd heard about this place, Umanok. Yeah, it means heart. Heart? Yeah, because they have a heart-shaped mountain there. That's the symbol of uh, Umanok. Okay. There are lots of pitfalls in the language because it's right. also, um, it's like Morse code. Yeah. Um, long and short vowels, long and short consonants. Mm -hmm. And that gives meaning. So, for example, there's a town called Maniitsok. Maybe you've seen it on the map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where they're thinking of having this aluminum plant. And Maniitsok means uh, une uneven ground, which right. is hilly. Yeah. Whatever. Mm -hmm. That's Maniitsok with two e's back to back. So it's Maniitsok. But if you said Maniitsok, yeah. with, with, with not going e, but e, yeah, just e. a short e, then it would mean the opposite. It would mean flat ground. And there are lots of things like that. Piavit means uh, you're crying. And P of it means you're freezing. The Greenlanders are not used to speaking with foreigners mm -hmm. as well. That also makes it so. So then if they have an opportunity to switch to Danish, you know, and things are getting a bit strange, you know, boom. Hmm. So you don't find yourself in very many situations, at least not here, where you're forced to use the language. Because you can always use Danish. Most people speak Danish. It's generally the lingua franca up here. Even people who say they don't speak Danish, they know quite a lot more Danish than, than, than I know of their language. When we got to Pamute, at first it seemed that no one in the entire town spoke any English, and we were mm. asking people, do you speak English? Mm. Speak people said, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> and uh, we'd say something in English, and people would just look at us, and we would think, okay, they definitely don't understand us. But by the end of the two weeks that we were there, it kind of seemed that everybody spoke English. <laughs> you know? Well, they get a lot of English yeah. in, uh, via television. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they yeah. don't really speak the language. Uh, Maybe it was the wrong question. Do you understand English? Might have gotten a response. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand a bit. I just and they never have an opportunity to speak to it. Speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they didn't know what the ex your expectations were. Right. Yeah. Maybe you wanted to engage in highly philosophical and political yeah, discussions yeah. with them for all they knew. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> no. But daily conversation about the weather and so whatnot, I think a lot of people, mm -hmm. at least passively, they understand it mm -hmm. and they're able to respond at a certain level. Um, is the Greenlandic language the same throughout Greenland? Like, is there? Is no, there are various dialects. No, no. You start learning are. the language, and you're learning the you're learning the official sort of high Greenlandic that they speak around around the Nuuk area, and then mm -hmm. down here in South Greenland. It's different, you know. Here, the here the, the vowels are certain vowels are pronounced differently. Certain different different words. I remember being very proud of myself learning the word for I don't know. I think matches. Yeah. And I went to the supermarket and asked for matches, and they didn't understand me. And then really? I realized that they have a different word for matches here, and it's like okay, a different word for this and that. And so they tell me that they can that they they definitely hear the difference between somebody who's from Narsak and somebody who's not going to talk. They have a different mm -hmm. accent, mm -hmm. just like in Ireland or other places in the world. Or yeah, Boston yeah, yeah, has a specific yeah. Boston accent, sure. but then there's also different vocabulary. And so all along the West Coast, it's basically different dialects of what's called West Greenlandic, which is the main Greenlandic language. Okay. And then if you have a different language on the East Coast, yeah. yep. which is incomprehensible more or less to most West Greenlanders, but the really? but the East Greenlanders learn West Greenlandic in school and hear it on the radio and television so they can understand it mm -hmm. and generally speak a certain, certain amount of that. And then way up in Tula, they have yet another language, which is huh. more or less incomprehensible to most Greenlanders.
Wow, I didn't, so I didn't know that. really, if you're to try and learn one of the dialects, you learn West Canadian. You learn the standard, the standard dialect, yeah, the, okay. you do, yeah. Um, like here, you say, a uh, yeah. that means things are okay, everything's fine. A yeah. 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 <laughs> How are you? Yeah. That's standard Nuuk dialect. Here, they actually say a yingilak. So you can shorten it too. You see, you can say a yungi. Hmm. Question mark a yungi. Is that? Yeah. Uh, but down here, they actually say a yingi. A yingi. Yeah. So and, and they the, were like there's a vowel change there. Oh. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And how many people are in Greenland altogether? About fifty-seven thousand. Wow! But that's including the, all the foreigners who live here as well. So. Yeah, only fifty-seven thousand people. Yeah. I yeah. I think my my university had more students than that. Yeah, no, I went to a university that had forty thousand students. Wow. Yeah. What are your three most favorite things about living here in Greenland? Oh, the, the, the clean uh, clean air and water. Um, yeah, yeah. We, we drink water from the stream here. Um, it's, that's the, the water you're drinking here is from the stream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The proximity of the ice cap, I think it's a fascinating thing to live next to uh, this incredibly huge, vast mountain of ice. It's a mountain, you know, it goes up to 3,000 meters. Living off the beaten track, I like it. Yeah. You can have four. You're I can have four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a bit of a paradise for us because Greenland is one of the few countries in the world where there uh, there is no um, private ownership of land, and that also means that there is nothing. There's no such thing as property taxes. Oh yeah. So uh, we don't pay rent. We don't because we own the place places mm -hmm. where we live. We don't owe money to the bank. We bought them outright. Yep. And we don't pay property taxes, hmm. um, so hmm. it's a rather affordable place for us to live in, in, in that sense. If you add it up over the years, we've saved a lot of money. Yeah. And the houses were relatively inexpensive. We paid for all of our houses in cash. You know? mm -hmm. Once you're established here, it's kind of a high cost of living, or it is, I mean... No, yeah, the cost of living up here is, 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 fair, is fairly high. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a Scandinavian standard of living, so it takes a while to get used to it. After a while, you stop converting in your head what this costs in euros or marks or dollars or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is not a cheap place to live in that sense. Hmm. Uh, and if you're coming here as a tourist, you know, hotels and, and restaurants and whatnot are not cheap. Because mm. I'd heard that rent was high and that kind of the standard of living was high. But some people have been saying that to live here isn't very expensive. So I was wondering... If you catch your own fish, I guess it's okay. Yeah, yeah but... Mm. I don't know. I mean, we go berserk when we go to places like like Germany and just buy all fresh fruit and veg and stuff. And yeah. it, for us, it's like it's Christmas. And it's mm -hmm. all it's all fresh and it's all cheap. And so, oh my God, they have fresh cauliflower and it's only you know three dollars a head. Yeah. You know, that's, that's so cheap. That's that's like that's the normal sale price. Let's make uh, you know that cauliflower yeah. casserole we normally make or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you visit Germany often? Do you leave Greenland every well, year? My, my, wife, well, my wife's folks live in, in Germany, of course, and my folks live in the States, so we sort of sort of trade off. So mm -hmm. I think I'm in the States about once every three years, and we're in Germany about once every three years. Wow. Or do you fish or hunt or anything like I'm that? I'm not a real big avid fish and fisherman or, or hunter, but I've had good days out fishing mm -hmm. uh, yeah. where I come back with, like, you know, wow. 35 kilos of Codfish, and wow, wow. stay up to two in the morning filleting them and yeah. putting them in plastic bags and freezing them. <laughs> mm -hmm. If we had more time, I'd make some fish. I've got fish. I've got, I picked up some fish two days ago. It's, it's got to be fried up. Yep. But we don't have time for that. Wow. You guys are on a tight schedule. I've got this cod fillet. Oh thing. wow! Uh, that's, yeah. my, that's my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> when we were in the grocery stores, it seemed that the produce section was a really small part of the entire market. Not like. Yeah, in it, it, Europe yeah. or the States where it's like a whole the, big wing. It's of the first thing that hits you when you walk into a supermarket in, in mm -hmm. Europe or the States is that's the produce, the fresh veg and everything is, is right there. And yeah. And here it's... It's, I mean, it's, under, it's sort of a sad... There's, there's some stuff corners that you, and you want some, to have a look like. It's better in Hakko Talk usually than it is here. I guess it would be hard to be yeah. a vegetarian if you were living here. Well, you'd have to eat a lot of um, frozen veggies. It would be rough. Possible. I heard about it, a vegetarian Greenlander. He was the son of a woman that we knew, and she said he's been a vegetarian for years and he lives here. Possible. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe he takes extra vitamin pills and stuff. Uh, we do, you know, mm -hmm. occasionally. Yeah. In the wintertime, vitamin D. You, mm -hmm. you don't get as much sunlight, so you need vitamin D. And... 
Do you ever eat whale meat? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah, occasionally, yeah. Is it available often? Not often. No. It's, uh, occasionally, yeah. Like at once a Sometimes season? Sometimes in the supermarkets, sometimes down at that fish market they sell whale really? sometimes. Wow. And then there's reindeer and muskox and things that, that you've probably never tried before. Mm -hmm. No. We tried some of the muskox uh, when we were in mm. that Poulson guy's house. So that was a, that was a real treat. It was like a strong beef. It was tasty. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mm. a lot of flavor to that. And occasionally it can be it can be tender. It can be tough, but it can be tender. Mm. Yeah, yeah I really enjoyed that. And they were so excited to introduce us to something new here. Yeah. Oh, well. Their hospitality was unreal. It was, it was really, really nice. <laughs> yeah, well, they don't get visitors from the outside that, that often. So. Mm. <laughs> but apparently, Drake was the first American that uh, they'd met. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're not like the people on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like them. It's so yeah. odd. Uh, yeah. You sure you're American? You sure you're not something? Yeah. I'll show you the office, and then, and then I'll show you um, uh, the summer place, mm -hmm. and then we can, from the summer place down to where the boat is, it's only like uh, yeah, a five minute walk, roughly. Perfect. That's for the summer house. Okay. You get one too. Summer place Thank in you. a cool country. And you, you didn't get my card here. There, and that's my wife's card. Oh, super. That's her business. So. Alu design. Yeah, actually, that's another green medic sound. <laughs> Put your tongue up behind your front teeth. So and then the air goes in along the sides of your tongue. <laughs> and there's ashu. It's the seal breathing hole. That's what that word means. It's a Greenlandic word for the seal breathing hole. We like living here a lot. I can see why. It's beautiful. It's quiet. Is there any crime in Narsa? Um, minimal. Not hardly any. Um, you have uh, domestic disputes. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a bit of breaking and entering. Yeah. Not much though. Did you have um, much problems with, with alcohol or drink? Yeah, people getting out of hand because they've had too much to drink. Yeah. You don't have any problems with gangs or you know people roughing you up or whatever. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I've never been in a situation where I felt uh, really threatened by anybody. Yeah. That grey house there, that's our office. Wow. And we have the shutters on the windows to keep the windows from getting blasted by the storms. A, this, oh, yeah. This hill here is made up of small stones. Oh, and yeah. You get these really strong winds, and they'll pick up the small stones and smash the glass. Wow. So, when we put new windows in a few years ago, we decided to protect them. Oh. Is there a hospital here in Narsa? Yeah, there is a hospital. Actually, they've downgraded it. It's no longer officially a hospital. It is a health center, but uh -huh. it's basically a hospital. It's still a, a, a doctor on duty mm -hmm. um, and a number of nurses. If they can't handle it in Hakotok, they, they fly them to Newark. And if they can't handle it in Newark, they fly them to Denmark. That's amazing. It is amazing, the logistics of it. Huh. This is your office. This is our office. Wow. This is, uh, Not a bad this view. is work. <laughs> Not a bad view at all. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. You work much better if you can separate yeah. work from, from private life. Huh. Huh. So when we go home, we try we try to leave the work behind us. And That's good. What happens, like, what happens here just stays here. You just leave work. Yeah, you can't do it 100%, but you, it's much easier if you can say, okay, I'm going to work until dinner time, and then I'm going to go home and eat dinner, yeah, and then yeah. I go yeah. home. <laughs> yeah, and go it's, home. It's a good commute as well. And did this need as wow. much work as the other one, or was it...? Uh, this place was actually in really good shape, I thought. I mean, the, the, all the doors were basically okay. We painted them, yeah. sanded them, and painted them. You know, the, the floors, we sanded them, <laughs> varnished them, and that's basically was it. The heating system had been off for a few years, but we got it up and running quickly. And So this is my wife's office. This is where she sits. Ah. The, the theory being that people would come by and she would have little conferences with them about their website and such. Yeah. My office is up here. And uh, it's kind of the office. This is where I hang out. I've got a view of the mountain out here, and I've got a view of the fjord over here. That's so one of the best views of an office I've ever seen. It's, 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 I love it. It's there wasn't a window here when we bought it. We had a carpenter put the window in for us, mm -hmm. and that made a big difference. And it was painted, I think, dark blue, the room. It, was, it oh, yeah. suddenly became a lot larger. And when we did the floors, it was like, okay, now yeah. it's gorgeous. It's really light and airy. I really like that little locker. Yeah, that's, that's where I keep the CDs and stuff. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so this is my work world. Here's Narsak, here's, here's uh, Hakotok. Mm -hmm. And there, where the island gets very small here, that's, that's where the hot springs are. So this is sort of our playground here. Do you know, are there many 
kayaking operators here or yeah there are, there yeah. are two two oh. places where you you could you could if you wanted to rent a kayak here mm -hmm. and then go kayaking they have the the suits that you wear and all that yeah. stuff yeah and we've got this sort of side business i created these helicopters i bought these helicopters from a catalog you've seen the red helicopters here yeah I thought if they were painted red and they maybe had like, you know, Greenland on, they could be a souvenir. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I contacted the company that makes them in Germany and... and uh, it looks like a solar panel on top. That's yeah, a solar uh, power. No way, really. Yeah. Oh, look at that guy. Yeah, there it is. You put it on your windowsill and then the sun comes out and it takes off. You sell them? Yeah, I sell them to, to tourist shops. I've got hundreds of these guys. Hi. But not really for kids because the solar panels can break if it drops. So uh, it's kind of like, nah, it's more yeah. like a toy for adults, you know. Yeah. It's very cool. Solar power is fun. You guys are gonna have to fight over who gets to keep it. Oh. <laughs> maybe it stays on board the boat. Maybe yeah. It becomes like the uh, the mascot helicopter or whatever. Okay, here you go, Jake. Well, You're the captain. You get the you get the helicopter. Thank you yeah. so much. Wow. So off to the next stop. Hi. Yes. Off we go. Now with, we have broadband, a broadband connection where you can be yeah. online all day. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, it's getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper. So yeah. Faster and faster. I mean, YouTube videos uh, a couple of years ago, uh, people would send me links to them and I would sort of laugh because, you know, you would click on the link. And it takes so long. And then uh, a still picture would appear. <laughs> and then after about a minute, they would kind of go, ah. And I would say, say to my mom, what happens when you click on that link? So what? I say, you see a video, right? Said, yeah. But no. No. Now we have a, a broadband connection that's better and I think we've got a deal where at the office we can use up to 20 gigabytes a month. Uh -huh. We don't get anywhere close to that and at home I think it's 9 gigabytes a month. Huh, huh. Look at all of those icebergs. This is our little dream house that we rent out. It's an excellent base for, for all kinds of things. So we've, um, I mean, we've done up the place. Anyway, this is a relatively new addition. We found oh. this company in Denmark that makes these Japanese doors, the traditional rice paper and all that. It lets in a lot more air and a lot more light, but it's uh, still very private. Uh, oh, Japanese futon. Yeah. And much to the chagrin of our local electrician, we did all the wiring uh, mm -hmm. in this part of the house ourselves when we renovated it. It's really nice in the morning when, we wake, when you wake up and you've got the sun shining in, uh, over, the, over the mountain there. Beautiful window with a beautiful view. Yeah. Oh, we just redid the kitchen, mm -hmm. which is a, a miniature kitchen. Wow. It's got everything you would need because we were, we were thinking that we would live here ourselves. When yeah. We yeah. sort of did, did, did it up. So it's got all the... Pots and pans and cutlery and, sh and knives and whatnot that you would want. Was, we just installed this. Stove, pantry. Uh, yeah, I found these funky, these funky tiles. It's kind of a stainless steel. Those are um, cool. Um, stainless so steel tiles. To replace the 1960s style, 70s style tiles, brown tiles that used to be throughout here. There's no shower, but there's hot and cold running water in the kitchen, uh -huh. and there's also a little sink here. Yep. So you can just sort of wash your hands, brush your teeth, and whatnot here, and... Really um, nice window. Yeah. A bucket toilet. Yeah. Which means fine. you go in the plastic okay. bag there. Come back in 10 years and maybe we'll have an actual real flush toilet. Because <laughs> it's a shitty job yeah. coming by and collecting somebody's bucket of mm -hmm. crap. So do you know? pay a service to do that? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty pricey. I think I think it's like altogether eight or 900 crowns per quarter. It's not quarter. cheap, you know, and you figure it's poor people, poorer people who have those kinds of toilets. Uh, they pay, you know, to get somebody to come and collect their stuff. Once a week? Three times a week. Three times a week. It's a job. I mean, I, you know, yeah. I don't think it's overpriced. So you take the but, bag and you just put it outside where they pick it up? Or yeah, they... you put it right in front of the door and they collect it. Mm -hmm. In fact, you could even just leave the door open and they would come inside and collect your bucket. Mm -hmm. You can do that too. Yeah. That's the bucket system. <laughs> So that's one of the things we have to explain to people when they come. It's like, you know, you're going to shit in this plastic bag, which is in this bucket, 
Yep. And you're going to put a little bit of this chemical stuff in there. It's a chemical toilet. Yep. And somebody's going to come and collect your shit. And it's going to be Monday and when Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays. So yep. you have to think on sun think on Sundays. You have to think. Remember to put the bucket out on Tuesday night and all this stuff. Yep. It'd be much easier to just say that's the toilet. Yep. Because uh, mm -hmm. we have the same situation here with we put in this electric heater. Yep. Um, which we got from Germany. It's got these special stones in there that sort of radiate the heat. Mm. Because he has so many troubles with the old kerosene stove, where mm. it was, you know, when it did try to use it, you know, then it would, uh, it was smoking, it was going out, the wind would blow it out, and mm -hmm. I don't know what, it was stinky, it was a mess. Uh, occasionally gases would build up in there, it would kind of go boom, you know, and, mm. and it's like, well, okay, this is like, plug it in, it works. Turn it on, turn it off. Turn it on, turn it off. Yeah, uh, your guess. Same thing with the gas stove that we had in the kitchen, had to give people this whole explanation about this is, this is, you know, butane gas. Be careful, turn it on, turn it off. Now it's an electric yeah. uh, stove. It's just like, this is the kitchen. You wow. Know? I love how these windows open like that. Yeah, isn't that nice? A real system? breeze. You can really... Wow. Look at that view. That's the most amazing view I've seen when in the When we saw this view, we were like just putty in the guy's hand. Just yeah. The, the, the carpenter who, was had, who owned the house, he was like... 50,000 grams. We're like, well, yeah, but the roof, you know, and the, the, the windows, you know, and this and that, you know, and it's been empty for all these years. 50,000 grams. Yeah, but could you maybe? 50,000 grams. I was like, okay. <laughs> 50,000 Done. <grams. laughs> for and that later on said, You could have gotten it for 25. I said, yeah, but we're only here for a few days, you know. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Wow. It's really, and it's, you know, people come here and they say, well, what can we do here in town? We say, well, there's the museum, you can take walks, and this and that, and they're kind of concerned about, are there going to be enough activities for us here? And then two days later, very generally, they'll, they'll move the table here, yeah. and just sit here and sort of look out the window. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, we've been observing that house there, and there's that fisherman over there, and, and, and the ice, and so on. And it's like, okay, so you found enough to do? Oh, yeah, we've been sleeping really well. You know? mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I bet they sleep fantastic here. God, it's so beautiful and it's so quiet. Yeah, yeah, you're this the last house in town. You've just got pure wilderness right up here behind you. There's the mountain and then that's it. And it comes with an enormous library. Yeah, all kinds of books end up here. We've got mm -hmm. junk literature, we got Shogun and so on. Oh. Uh, good junk, bad junk. And then the occasional sort of odd Danish book and German book. What's that? That's the kerosene stove. Oh. That's the old kerosene stove. They, they used to heat the whole place. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it hasn't been used in about four or five years now. Oh, it's, it's an old it's an old kerosene stove. Wow. Yeah? Yeah. And it stinks and it makes uh, <laughs> all kinds of all kinds of black stuff. Oh. Soot comes out and I'm I'm yeah. I made this table, you know, I was experimenting with uh, pieces of uh, wood and, and with these, these, um... The rollers are nice. Yeah, the rollers. Wow. So I went to some company that sells, you know, the rollers that you can use. I love that. That's furniture. beautiful. And I figured, you know, we, we needed a table, but we didn't want, it's so little space in here, you don't want one with corners. Yeah. yeah. So when I found these, these, these pieces of wood, I thought, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. We also made the bookshelves, you know, it's... Out of... That. Stainless bolts and just, nuts. Yeah, just, just, yeah, this actually it's not even stainless. It's not? No, wow. it hasn't rusted. And how old is this house? It's from 62. <laughs> it's just as old as I am. I was born in 62. The house is from, was built in 62. What a great place to sit right here and write your novel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would love to, to find somebody who's, who wants to write the, the great American novel or whatever and says, I'll just rent it out for the whole summer, yeah. give me a deal. And yeah. I'll say, okay, you rent it out for the whole summer, we'll reserve it all for you, you can be here for 12 weeks or whatever, you got three months to write your novel or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and then give them some, just some sort of a deal. Because it's work for us, uh, communicating with people, uh, answering uh, all kinds of questions that they have. When, when people arrive, we, pick them, we generally pick them up where the boat comes in or the helicopter. Um, make sure that they get that they also make their 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 flight, or like you guys. Yeah. Make sure you make your boat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all of that. And if, if somebody came for the summer, great, because that would free us up entirely. Yep. yep. That would be ideal, because then we could just say, right, well, we're going to be gone for the next three weeks, but you know, if some if there's an emergency, here are two numbers you can call. And, mm -hmm. So yeah. you'd really like to rent this for a whole season for the the entire summer season. Oh, I would season. love to do that. I would give people a, a deal. Yeah, I'd oh. definitely do that. That would make life so much easier for us. What is your website? How can people find out more? 
It's uh, www.silamut, which means outside in Greenlandic. It's mm -hmm. S-I-L-A-M-U-T mm -hmm. dot com. Gotcha. And that's it. This is Paul's rental cottage. On the left side here, we've got a Japanese bedroom with these two beautiful lamps. Beautiful bookcase and check out that window view. It's bright and airy and has these beautiful Japanese rice paper doors, sliding doors. It's really cozy in there. Here we've got a bureau for your clothes, hangers for your coat. Continuing inside on the right here, we've got the kitchen. Very efficient and comes with utensils and bowls and plates and cooking pots and pans and this is an electric stove. Pantry. Across from the kitchen, we've got the bathroom. A little cold water sink, medicine cabinet, light, beautiful skylight window. And a typical Greenlandic toilet situation where that bucket with the plastic bag goes in there. When it gets full enough, you take the plastic bag and put it outside and a service comes by and picks it up. It's got a really airy, comfortable atmosphere. And this is the main room with a table here for eating or for working and a couch over here, very Which comfortable folds out couch. Into a bed as well. Oh, as well. We have an outdoor bathtub that we may install right next to the house. That, wow. That um, is heated with a wood stove. Oh, that would be fantastic. That's, I think that's going to be the addition that's going to make it paradise. Wow. We've got the bookcase library here. Multilingual. Multilingual bookcase library. Finally, here is the major selling point, we think. This view, it's the most beautiful view that I have seen in Greenland from any house. Look at all of those birdie pits. It's just breathtaking. With a little porch on the outside here. So, if you're gonna write the next big novel, you can do it from right here with that view. Can you picture it? I can. Well, thank you so much for showing us this, oh, you're welcome. Yeah. this wonderful town of Narsak and your home and your office and your rental cottage. It's been an amazing day for us. <laughs> I'm glad I kidnapped you. Yeah. <laughs> we thought we were going to be working on the boat all day. And, yeah, uh, this, is, this is definitely you've not been, in the you've schedule. You've been abducted. <laughs> <laughs> the, the local, the hostile natives have taken you. Oh, yeah. Is that us? That's you. Okay. Go on board. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you so much. It was really good to meet you. It was wonderful. Yep. See you on the internet. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Smooth sailing. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Glad we got to see Narsak. Wonder how fast this boat goes. It was 275 kroners to go from here, Narsak, to Kakar Kakartok. Oh, I guess we're off. Just cast off the stern line there. Wow. That was someday. Drake Paragon. <laughs>